Within a lot of games, especially role-playing games, items serve as a core and indispensable resource that's there to support players, especially in a game's earlier stages. Final Fantasy would be no different, as the consumption of items would serve to assist the player in a myriad of helpful ways. Most commonly, they would be aligned with recovery, combat application and exploration, but sometimes they would go beyond, functioning as a means to teach characters new and special abilities. Moreover, sometimes they would even act as components for equipment crafting and serve as the keys to obtaining even more precious goods. But with each subsequent title, items like game mechanics, narratives and characters have evolved to become much more unique and diverse in their functions. This would see developers get creative, incorporating a wealth of dynamic and potent resources that would not only add a thrilling twist to gameplay, but would have the potential to turn the tides in various situations. As such, this would see items play host to their own entire category of game-changing provisions, especially within endgame content, and it meant that these items would serve to provide more than just rudimentary healing or enhancement, but applications that were nigh on game-breaking. However, in exchange for their heightened prowess, they would most often be hard to obtain, and would require some meticulous endeavours on the player's part. In light of these respective traits, these extraordinary consumables could sometimes be likened to that of ultimate weapons, high-level spells, and even powerful accessories. And it's those extraordinary consumables that we'll be discussing today, as we'll be delving into some awesome and invaluable items that can make playthroughs a breeze. As a minor disclaimer to clarify the subject matter though, for this video we will not be categorising weapons, spells, accessories or key items as items in this vein. Instead, we will solely be focusing on resources that are expendable within a combat scenario. So strap yourselves in as we explore 7 of the most powerful items across the Final Fantasy franchise relative to the games they were featured in, and we're going to kick things off with a deceptively simple shuriken from Final Fantasy 3. When Final Fantasy III released back in 1990, it introduced a number of intriguing and remarkable mechanics, many of which would become core components of the series. Some of these would include the introduction of summons, the job switching system, and very notably, the expansion of existing jobs. In this regard, the ninja job would distinguish itself from the rest of the jobs in light of its newly assigned game mechanic, the powerful throw command. This would enable performing characters to quite literally throw equipment or designated projectile items, and even though throwing such items would result in its loss from the player's possession, it would also yield a significant increase in damage as opposed to normal combat use. This meant that weapons and materials wielded by ninjas had substantial offensive potential, and the most powerful of these would be none other than the shuriken. In the original Famicom release of Final Fantasy III, shurikens were items that could only be equipped as a weapon for a normal attack execution, but it would ultimately retain its consumable properties as it would be lost following the action. Later on, in the game's remake, it would become an item only usable via the throw command, and this was where the shuriken came to the fore. With a whopping base power of 200, the shuriken's power not only rivalled that of the ultimate onion sword in the Famicom version, but would also be formidable as a damage dealing item in the remake. And depending on the ninja player's job level, shurikens had the potential to deal 9999 damage upon a single use. This would make it the most powerful projectile item in both versions of the game, capable of dealing a significant amount of damage in a short space of time but the sheer power of the shuriken will be balanced out by how infrequent and costly they would be to acquire. Shurikens could be found in locations such as the Crystal Tower and Eureka, and players would also have the opportunity to purchase them in Eureka, but they would come at the not so small price of 65,500 gil a pop, making them quite difficult to accumulate. But considering the power, perhaps the price tag was a rather appropriate measure. The Hero Drink, also known as the Hero Cocktail or Hero, is perhaps one of the most iconic support items in the franchise. It first made waves as early as Final Fantasy V, and it became iconic because it would bestow a series of emboldening buffs like heavy stat boosts or even invincibility. In Final Fantasy VIII's case, the Hero, as it was known, would apply the latter enhancement, granting invincibility for a short period of time. However, even though that would be powerful and useful, its raw power paled in comparison to an evolved form called the Holy War. 
Holy Wars would be a significant leap up from hero drinks as they would not just apply the invincibility status to one character but the entire party upon use. Not only that, but the status effect would last for 24 seconds, rendering affected characters impervious to physical and magical damage. All status ailments would also be alleviated and further prevented, along with an additional immunity to dispel commands. And while the party could still lose health from executing the dark side ability, they were still able to use recovery spells and items all while invincible. Thus, Holy Wars would essentially make the party untouchable in combat, which would be a major advantage against some of the game's most powerful bosses, and more so, the super bosses in the endgame. And considering players could acquire at least 11 Holy Wars, this meant it was possible to have a near ample store of this nearly game-breaking resource to spread across a number of challenging encounters. Now, to acquire the Holy Wars, the methods of acquisition could be quite troublesome. Some could, for example, be stolen from Cypher during the third and fourth boss fights against him, or they could be dropped from the same battles, albeit with lower probability. They could also be refined from 10 Holy War Trials, as well as the Gilgamesh Triple Triad card via card mod, which would actually yield a generous amount of 10 Holy Wars. But even though the process would be lengthy, their sheer power would make them invaluable for making it through some of the game's toughest encounters unscathed. As the franchise continued to evolve, the compendium of equipment and resources would expand to feature more and more intricate goods. A prime example of this would be the death-inflicting Far Plains Shadow item in Final Fantasy X, which was appropriately specific to that particular game. But amongst the series' vast collection of unique items, one of the most standout and destructive powers players could wield in their pockets would be Dark Energy, an item only found within Final Fantasy XII the Zodiac Age. Dark Energy is considered to be the most powerful offensive item in the game, serving as a somewhat enhanced version of Dark Matter. Upon use, it would deal 50,000 damage to all enemies within its area of effect. Moreover, in contrast to Dark Matter, which needed knots of rust to charge, Dark Energy would inflict static damage to enemies instantly without relying on any such requirement. Furthermore, it did not depend on external factors. And while Dark Matter could technically cap at dealing 60,000 damage with enough charges, Dark Energy would be much more consistent. Boasting this slew of impressive characteristics, Dark Energy would be a mighty asset in battles, particularly for endgame content as it was virtually free and supplied ample damage. As such, it's considered a viable strategy for conquering Stage 100 in Trial Mode, where players have to take on all 5 Arcadian Judges at the same time. In light of its incredible utility, it makes sense that Dark Energy isn't that easy to come by. However, there are a few different ways to obtain it, with the simplest of these requiring the player to trade in loot to make it available for purchase as a mysterious substance in the bazaar. However, only one could be available through this method. The other methods of acquisition would be a bit more complicated. Dark Energy could potentially be harvested from chests in Mount Baramasais, Arcades, and the Sorobi Steppe but this would only be possible if the party leader had a diamond armlet equipped. And even if that was the case, there was an 80% chance that the chest would instead contain gill. These chests, even though they would technically be capable of respawning, would also be a rare occurrence. Interestingly, however, there would be a way to farm dark energy more efficiently. This would require players to follow a specific series of steps that would enable them to manipulate the random number generations in their favor, thus ensuring their procurement of an ample supply. If you'd like to find out more about this method, we'd recommend checking out this video from Fuzzfinger Gaming. The Via Infinito dungeon in Final Fantasy X-2 would offer some of the most challenging game content in the series, and this would be consistent with some of the demanding challenges in Final Fantasy X, such as the side quests and minigames required for obtaining the celestial weapons. As such, even though progressing through each floor of the Via Infinito felt like an exercise in endurance, it would ultimately prove to be a rewarding experience. But this wasn't just because of the heavy spoils at the end. As the dungeon played host to a wealth of powerful fiends, encountering them could allot players a myriad of valuable items. And one particular item that could be found in the upper echelons was three stars. Three stars would be an extraordinary support item for battle, allowing players to essentially nullify MP costs for the entire party's spells and skills. This meant that players could use a number of powerful MP-guzzling spells and abilities without having to worry about conservation. 
Additionally, the item would also void any HP loss from the Dark Knight's Darkness ability, something that separated it away from the iteration found within Final Fantasy X. As three stars could be obtained before reaching the two final super bosses in the dungeon's end, this would make it exceptionally useful for those battles. And this was because Paragon and Tremor would be fought consecutively without any opportunity for the party to recuperate, therefore the MP pool could be subject to significant depletion. Three stars would be indispensable for preserving MP and ensuring the party's effectiveness across both of the battles. To obtain three stars, players would need to bribe Omega Weapon, which could appear as a random encounter on floors 75 to 79 of the Via Infinito. Although players would have to fork out a generous sum of 151,250 gil, they would receive 33 stars in exchange, which in hindsight wasn't a bad deal. Now, in many early Final Fantasy games, when random encounters were a core part of the ecosystem, there were some random encounters that had the potential for some remarkable rewards. This could come in the form of either large amounts of experience and gill through to awesome weapons, accessories and enemy skills, as well as rare items. Thus, it would often be common practice for players to put much time and effort into seeking out these special foes in the hopes of grinding for spoils. In Final Fantasy IV, this would be very pertinent, as to obtain the best gear you would need to obtain Pink Tails, but Pink Tails only dropped from the Flan Princess, a very rare spawn. Now, one method for finding these slippery foes would be to just chance your luck, but the developers also included an item that could be used to manipulate spawning. And so, even though it's not a powerful item in the traditional sense of having an instant effect on your party's performance, the Siren would have an indirect effect as it would speed up access to some of the most powerful gear in the game. Not to be confused with the Summon Siren, Sirens in Final Fantasy IV were like alarms, and when used, they would make a sound that would summon the rarest cluster of monsters in that specific location. This would be incredibly advantageous as they could be used to summon the Flam Princess immediately. The only downside was that beyond the fight, the Pink Tail also had a terrible drop rate, with there only being a 1 in 64 chance of it being dropped. But as Sirens were capable of instantly forcing players into encounters with the Flam Princess, they were essential for making farming much more efficient, and for that reason we feel it warrants a place on this list. Final Fantasy II would be a rather unique entry within the mainline franchise. But even though this statement is applicable to many aspects of the game design, it's perhaps most notable for its leveling system. Instead of the party's stats improving when receiving experience, this meant stats would instead increase based on how players performed within combat, and this system of character growth meant that maxing out specific stats would require meticulous planning on the part of the player, and even some bending of the rules. The time and effort required, however, could be circumvented within short spurts by an item called the Sage's Wisdom. When used in battle, Sage's Wisdom could max out a character's intelligence stat to 99 for one battle only. As the intelligence stat corresponded to the performance of black magic, this would render offensive spells very powerful and accurate for a finite period of time and due to how much of a boost this would grant to magical performance, Sage's Wisdom would give players a significant advantage, proving especially useful during difficult boss encounters. Alongside the Sage's Wisdom also existed the Saint's Spirit. Instead of maxing out intelligence, this would focus on spirit, enhancing white magic. Now as expected, these items would be quite rare, but there were multiple opportunities through which Sage's Wisdom could be acquired. They could be found in Castle Dice, Dice Cavern, and Floor 5 of Pandemonium, as well as being dropped by the Lamia Queen and Beelzebub. And that brings us on to our final and arguably most highly valued item on this list, the Megalixir. The Megalixir would make its debut in Final Fantasy VI, where it emerged as an evolved form of the highly potent Elixir. Ever since then, they have been prized and essential items in almost every game in the series. The most typical and broad purpose of the Megalixir has been to restore an entire party to their base, full health condition. But there has been plenty of variance as to the actual application. Often, this would see the entire party recover all of their HP and MP, but there have been variations of this. For example, in Final Fantasy XV, it would not just restore current HP, but also lowered maximum HP, current MP, and it would remove the stasis and danger status effects. 
But even though there are numerous iterations, there's one Megalixir that trumps the others, and it's the one that appears within World of Final Fantasy. It was in this particular title that Megalixirs covered more ground by not just fully restoring HP and MP, but by removing all status ailments as well. This made it an asset that allowed players to completely reset mid-battle, which would give them a clear advantage over any already weakened foe. As such, this would make them an invaluable resource for all and any challenges, especially punishing endgame content like the XG Superboss fight. The only other game in which Megalixes would technically function in a similar manner would be Final Fantasy VIII, although due to the nature of magic casting in the game, the item would of course have no effect on MP or skill point restoration. Now, in light of the considerable power of Megalixers within World of Final Fantasy, it's no surprise that they will be hard to acquire. Some could be found in areas like the Train Graveyard, Castle X9 and the Hidden Dungeon. They could also be obtained as a reward for the mini venture side quests and various Colosseum challenges. But the rates would be low, and as such, amassing Megalixers would require substantial effort from the player. And with that, we've reached the end. They were seven exceptionally powerful items across the Final Fantasy franchise. Did any of these items carry you through your playthroughs? Please share in the comments below, and if you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a like and subscribe to the channel. Alright everyone, with that, this is Daryl signing out. As always, I'd like to give a big thank you to all of our Patreon and YouTube membership supporters, especially Benjamin Snow, The Livestream, Elsa Claire Farron, Gaussian Dikujata, Gregory, Justin Dent, and Zook and TDK who are super special Onion Eye supporters, and of course, a big thank you to everyone for watching this video. I'll see you all again soon for more Final Fantasy goodness.